Okay, let's continue on with our talk of special populations. Uh, any questions from any of the previous material so far? All right, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the pediatrics. This is kind of my jam. This is what I've been doing for the past, uh, I guess it's close to five years now. So I've been working at Nemours. Uh, we opened up in 20... 2012, yeah, so I've been doing this for close to five years, so it's not something I ever expected to be doing, but um, it's definitely a, a very rewarding kind of uh, area to go into if you ever have any interest in that. But um, why is pediatrics so different? Like, can you just treat them like little adults? I wish I could. I tried doing that with my child, and it goes over very poorly. But um, they're very heterogeneous population. If you think about something like you know a uh, you know a 24 week gestational age uh, neonate versus a 16 year old, like there are huge differences in their biology, um, and they undergo pretty much consistent changes through that entire time period, and that affects drugs in, in several different ways. Uh, one of the other big problems we have is you know is it how easy is it to do clinical studies on kids? not super easy right so it's kind of like doing uh, studies on inmates or on pregnant women like there are protected groups uh, because they are at risk for you know a lot of ethical issues and things like that so it's harder to do those kind of studies we can still do some of them but a lot of the data that we have regarding things like pharmacodynamics and kinetics is kind of back extrapolating it from adult data and so as I just mentioned they're very different from adults in a lot of ways and so you may not always find that's going to be really comparing apples to apples right um, so we'll look at some of the, the problems with that but basically, you're going to be able to find um, several different factors to go into, like when you're deciding when or what type of drug to use for a patient. Um, you're looking at things like, you know, looking at their age-dependent changes in the pharmacodynamics of things, um, looking how their disease processes are going to change how they'll handle those drugs. So, for instance, a patient who has cystic fibrosis is going to have uh, very uh, different kinetics for you know, a particular type of drug versus someone who does not have that disease state. So that's one thing we have to consider. Um, looking at their, their age-dependent pharmacokinetic data, Try to figure out what type of dosing should we use. How frequently should we be giving that dose? We'll look at some examples of that in a second. And you're looking at things like, you know, uh, what will the patient tolerate? You know, if I try to give a big, you know, potassium chloride tablet to a one-year-old, they're not going to be able to take that, right? You have to think about age-specific uh, dosage forms and things to make it a little bit easier for the patients to actually get the drug in their system. So. Um, Looking at the, the lingo that we're going to be using regarding pediatrics, uh, we're going to refer to gestational age being that maturity at birth, essentially. Um, we use this, we'll basically use this date based on the last menstrual period for the mom, and also you know, based on things like physical exam. And, and for instance, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting, my wife for the second uh, baby, and I don't want to give you guys too many gory details, um, but because she was still breastfeeding at the time she got pregnant, you know, that kind of screwed up her ovulation. So it was very difficult to determine when the actual conception date was versus how far developed uh, the baby was. So oftentimes we were actually using the, the ultrasound and based off the measurements there, we can get a little bit easier uh, idea of how many weeks along the actual fetus was. So just an example of a difference there. Um, but basically, you also look at their postnatal age, which is just going to be the chronological age after they're born. And then we'll consider as post-conceptional age, just the, uh, the summation of those two. So we use gestational age very, very frequently when we're looking at uh, especially neonates. Uh, we'll talk about what that neonate specifically is, uh, but especially during that first year of life or so, we're going to use that term most frequently. So um, we'll consider preterm to be anything less than 37 weeks gestational age, uh, full term to be 37 to 42 post-term being anything greater than 43 weeks. Uh, and then uh, as far as newborns or neonates, this is going to refer to that first 28 days of life. This will be important, especially when we talk about, you know, how you will kind of triage a patient based on are they in that first 28 days or not, especially if they come in for like fever, especially of unknown origin. Um, you know, you have to really kind of delineate, okay, what type of bugs are they going to be likely to experience in that first 28 days versus after that? And you'll see there's going to be some changes there, which we'll talk about when we get into farm. And then uh, infant will be that first uh, basically year of life. Uh, you may hear me refer to some newborns or neonates as an infant as well. Sometimes you can use that interchangeably, but specifically when you mention a neonate, it's that first 28 days or so. Toddler, use that first uh, one to two years. Young children, two to five or so. Older child, six to 12. And then finally, like an adolescent, about 13 to 17. And when do you think you can start treating them kind of like an adult? Usually around the adolescent age, as soon as they start to get their, once their weights are starting to get up, especially once they're kind of post-puberty, um, they're 
pretty well developed for the most part. You can start to um, look at them a little bit more like an adult patient, uh, more so than you would for like a neonate. Okay, a lot of their physiology you're going to see by the time they're kind of in those late teens, uh, they're going to be very very similar to adult patients. We even have some you know uh, of our teenagers are coming in that are bigger than adult patients, and so you're going to find that there's certain dosing considerations you have to do there. Okay, how to make sure you're not going to accidentally give them too much drug. You know, we have a contract with Disney, uh, and so, you know, the sports complex over there, if you have, like, you know, big football tournaments or there's cheerleading tournaments uh, every summer, uh, guess where they all come when they end up getting injured? Come straight to us, and then we have, like, you know, very big teenagers that we're dealing with, especially the football players that, you know, would, are getting, if you dosed it just based on their weight, they'd be well in excess of adult uh, size doses. So we'll look at some considerations there in a little bit. Um, this is a very creepy looking picture, um, but we're going to use it for the graphs, not necessarily for uh, the depiction of a newborn. I'm glad my child did not look like that. But anywho, <laughs> these we're going to focus on are some of the changes that occur over time uh, with uh, small children and looking to see, you know, look how the kinetics change, how their absorption is going to differ, distribution, metabolism, excretion, how all that will be developing getting more mature as the, the infant is growing. So first thing we're going to look at is going to be absorption, looking at things like changes in gastrointestinal function, and then also their integumentary uh, development. Because again, do you think uh, that a newborn is going to have very well-developed skin? Probably not. It's pretty thin, right? So we're going to talk about some uh, instances of toxicity you can actually see uh, in those kind of uh, those type of patients. So anyway, uh, looking at absorption, we know that the kind of physiochemical properties of a drug is that uh, make it depend or that will have a great effect on absorption is going to be uh, things like molecular weight. So the larger the molecule, the harder it has time being absorbed. Uh, the actual particle sizes we're dealing with, we mentioned already that pH and pKa, right? So going back to your henderson hasselbalch equation, and then looking at the dosage form that we're actually giving. So how is the drug actually being dispersed? Is it uh, we're giving a solution or we're actually giving a tablet? You know, what, what specifically are we giving? It'll have some, um, some impact on the drugs. And then we're also going to look at how, uh, where we're actually going to be administering the drug to see what type of absorption we're going to have. And there's a lot of differences that occur, especially with young babies and as they uh, get a little bit older as they develop. So um, looking at gastric absorption, some of the major things that will determine how well they absorb drugs is going to be the gastric acidity and then the gastric emptying time. And how acidic do you think uh, like a newborn's uh, gastric secretions are going to be? Probably not very, right? If also you think about what's been kind of going through their GI tract when they're uh, in utero. Well, they do swallow some amniotic fluid, right? Because they're still producing things like meconium, which is a kind of that initial um, you know, kind of feces that they're developing there. So um, they do have some amniotic fluid going through their GI tract to some degree. And what do you think the pH of the amniotic fluid is? Pretty close to neutral, yeah. So again, they're having this kind of wash out of their GI tract, and a lot of times, especially if they're more immature, they may not be producing a lot of stomach acids yet. So typically, what you're going to find is that, especially in the first couple weeks of life, their GI tract is going to be much more on the basic side of things. And so we mentioned, you know, what type of impact do you think that would have, like on acidic drugs, that make the absorption better or worse? Mm -hmm. Should make it worse, right? Because we said that like dissolves like. So if you were to put a weak acid into a more basic solution, it ends up being more protonated. I'm sorry, it ends up being more uh, charged because it's unprotonated, uh, which will make it more difficult for it to cross those, those lipid uh, bilayers, right? So we can find some uh, differences there in, in seeing some uh, impediment to absorption. And then uh, gastric emptying time, you're going to see that the, the actual ability for the GI tract to pass food along is going to be uh, altered, again, especially if it's. Um, a lot of it's based on the development and how developed the child was when they were born, uh, but it's going to differ very greatly uh, based on these two characteristics between infants uh, and adults. So, um, looking at that pH-dependent passive diffusion again, uh, with especially with preterm infants, the more preterm they are, the more underdeveloped they kind of are, especially in the GI tract. So they're not really producing a lot of acids, so the pH should be increased, uh, and you'll find that the gastric acid secretion should be going up as the gestational age gets uh, later and later. Right. So this is why a lot of like premature infants, when they come out, um, they have a lot of feeding issues that occur because their GI tract is really not ready yet um, to you know handle things like enteral feeding and, and whatnot. And so, for instance, um, you know, for a full-term infant, um, you'll see the gastric pH is usually around 6 to 8 for, say, the first 1 to 3 days. And a lot of it's due to that amniotic fluid kind of washout that happens there. After that, they'll start to produce their own acids, um, and then they'll be able to bring that pH back down. Usually around um, the highest acid content, uh, especially those term infants, around 1 to 10 days or so, you'll see that. And then uh, they'll end up kind of lowering the acid content down between 10 to 30 days. Uh, and 
you know, eventually by three months, they're going to start to approximate roughly adult values. So they kind of have, especially if they're underdeveloped, they'll have very little acid production. They kind of ramps up pretty significantly to try to bring that pH down. And then it kind of gets back to normal adult levels around three months or so. So as I mentioned, for acidic drugs, uh, if you have the increased ionization, you're going to have decreased absorption. So more of it's in that charge state for weak bases. You're going to find they're actually have, going to have increased absorption of some drugs. So and again, this will influence kind of what drugs we decide to use in an infant versus someone who would be a little bit older. Okay, and looking at gastrointestinal emptying time or the GIT, um, you can see that uh, basically this is going to be the, the determining that rate of absorption. You're going to find that for infants, it's usually going to be a lot slower. So usually less than uh, less than six months of age end up being a little bit slower, and that can affect how uh, quickly drugs get absorbed. Um, in those cases. So, you know, if they are kind of sitting around in the stomach for a longer period of time, they don't really get absorbed very well from there. Um, they won't be absorbed very quickly. Thus, it'll be kind of um, slower time to get to those kind of peak levels. You can also see some other um, factors affecting this as well. So looking at patients who have like congenital heart disease, oftentimes if they're having kind of poor blood flow, especially to the GI tract, um, that can end up slowing down the uh, gastrointestinal time as well. Um, the type of feeding they may be getting. So sometimes if they have to get a special type of formula or something that can affect this. Um, and then looking at that gestational and postnatal age. So the kind of more immature they are, uh, the more likely they are to have kind of a slow GIT. And shorter transit time um, can decrease uh, the the duration of drug contact with absorptive surfaces. So sometimes they may have kind of overactive um, or too quick of uh, gastric emptying, and that can actually slow down or uh, limit the ability for drugs to actually be absorbed, especially if they're having any kind of GI issues like diarrhea or anything like that. Um, so if you were to give something like an extended release preparation, which is meant to be uh, absorbed over, say, a 12-hour period, uh, you may not get the full effect of the drug from that because they're eliminating it too quickly. But, um, and this may account for some patients getting, uh, you know, high enough levels of a drug. Other patients may not get high enough levels due to um, kind of impaired absorption. Okay. Um, so looking at uh, kind of parenteral administration uh, or uh, extra oral administration of drugs, you're going to see the, uh, some big differences here in regard to things like muscular blood flow. This is going to affect our intramuscular injections. Uh, we're going to find that typically for neonates, this will be reduced. Uh, for actually for infants, it ends up being an increased. Uh, and then by the time they're a child, uh, be considered kind of near adult patterns. We'll talk about some of the implica implications for this in a minute. Um, looking at things like mucosal permeability, um, children uh, end up being very, very efficient, uh, especially in the early stages of life. Um, this is important because uh, what type of mucosal areas do you think we'd be administering drugs to these children? A highly vascular area. Mm, yeah, the rectum is actually one of the big places. So we give a lot of suppositories uh, for infants, and so that's because they have really good absorption um, uh, in the via the rectal route. So that can be one way we can do that. And then looking at skin permeability, you're going to notice this is going to be increased. I mentioned they have kind of an underdeveloped uh, stratum corneum uh, early on in life. So you're going to notice that um, they actually have increased absorption of certain things through the transdermal route, which can lead to some pretty significant toxicity if you're not careful. We'll talk about some examples of that in just a few minutes. So uh, looking at intramuscular absorption first, uh, you're going to see this can be dependent on several factors. So looking at how well perfused uh, the, the how much blood is actually going through the area where you've injected the medication, um, the ability for that drug to penetrate through the capillaries. So if it's you know more lipophilic, has an easier time doing that. Um, and then also kind of the, the apparent volume for which the drug has been distributed. We talk about distribution. We'll see how they kind of differ. Uh, and basically small children, little babies, they're actually just kind of big bags of water. We'll look at some what that means in, in just a few minutes. But um, we're going to see that with neonates uh, and infants, you're going to find they're going to have decreased blood flow to the muscles. Um, a lot of times, especially if they're underdeveloped or if they're uh, premature, you're going to find they have really issues um, with supplying good blood flow to the muscles. They have problems like temperature regulation and whatnot. Um, they're also going to have an in, uh, increased amount of water located within the muscles. Uh, so they're going to have an increased apparent volume of distribution, especially for more like hydrophilic medications, because uh, we'll just have a kind of a higher area for it to kind of distribute out to. Uh, and they have a decreased amount of muscular contractions. So this actually will help to decrease the rate of actual drug absorption uh, when that's occurring there, just because the muscles usually aren't moving around a whole lot in those kind of first uh, couple weeks of life. And I mentioned that that kind of peripheral vasomotor instability, they don't regulate their temperatures very well in the early time period. Um, so that can impair uh, absorption in some cases as well.
So um, rectal absorption, again, increased bioavailability of some medications, mainly due to uh, ease of transmucosal uh, or translocation uh, through the mucosal layer. Um, so again, we oftentimes will give things like Tylenol suppositories very frequently. Um, that's probably one of the main medications we're giving. I'm trying to think of any other like super common ones. And that's usually a lot of like laxatives and things like that. But Tylenol is a great one to give, especially if they're having like you know fever in those young children. You can administer that very easily when uh, giving things by the oral route may not be so easy. Um, who's ever had to give uh, oral medications to a kid before? Yeah, you don't really have a good appreciation for it until you've actually had to do it yourself and then you end up getting it all over you basically. Um, so if you can use something via the rectal route and they don't really mind so much, it's, it's the way to go. But you can also have problems though with uh, neonates and, and small children. They can have an increased amplitude of rectal contractions. So they can actually end up, uh, especially when they get that stretch reflex from placing something like a suppository in the rectum, you can end up having kind of uh, it uh, being expelled too quickly and you may not have a good drug absorption, which may require you to like, kind of redose them uh, if they did not have it in place for very long. Uh, other things we can do uh, for these kids, uh, getting an IV on a young child, especially like a, a, a neonate, can be very, very difficult. Um, they have very, very small, kind of fragile veins. Anyone tried to give like a, do an IV on an infant before? No. Okay, how, how hard was it compared to like an adult? It's hard. It requires like multiple people. Yep. Yeah, so again, they might be moving on you. Uh, it can be difficult to find a suitable vein. Um, be very, very hard. And so, in which case, um, especially in emergent cases, you may need to go via other routes. Um, so, in some cases, intraosseous is going to be one of your go-to ways to go. Um, Basically, children are going to have an even easier time to place one of these than an adult because they have kind of a soft outer cortex, especially with the long bones. Um, and the marrow there is, is very vascular. Uh, basically, it's like a nice kind of non-compressible vein. You can start to administer medications. Um, so, for instance, when I was working just a few weeks ago, um, we had a six-week-old that came in. It's a very young kid. Uh, they were in, in uh, supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. Um, and we needed to get uh, IVs in that patient very, very quickly because we needed to give a drug called adenosine to, to uh, convert that patient. Um, Basically, they tried to use uh, everybody get like a scalp vein, but that ended up blowing. They tried using uh, a vein in the arm, that ended up blowing. Uh, the intraosseous, though, is where to give this. And do you guys know what bones you can use this in? Tibia is a big one. Humerus. Humerus. Sternum. Sternum. Mm -hmm. Those are probably the main ones you're going to end up seeing. Uh, and basically, we have like, you know, this is kind of a manual uh, one that they would use, but we have basically a power drill essentially that will, it looks like a big thumbtack you're, you're sticking to the patient, but it'll drill down into the bone very quickly. Apparently it's pretty painless. Um, I've not experienced it myself, nor would I like to, so uh, I can't really, uh, you know, account for that. But uh, essentially we're able to get the, the IO access very easily, and they're able to give all our medications to the patient very, very quickly. So medications, we can give fluids, uh, if we need to get blood, whatever we need to give, we can all give it through the IO, uh, which is a very, very convenient way to do it. So sometimes you may, you may see this being done for, for small kids, especially in emergent situations. Okay. Uh, looking at percutaneous absorption or uh, you know transdermal absorption, you're going to find that kids have underdeveloped stratum corneum, uh, especially the the younger they are. Uh, that thickness is going to be inversely related to absorption. So remember that fixed law we were looking at. Uh, the thicker the membrane you're trying to cross through, the harder it's going to be to have that flux. But these kids have very thin membranes, so they're going to be able to cross relatively easy. Um, good example of this: uh, you don't use betadine with infants. Uh, betadine is a common antiseptic you might use like in surgery realm or something like that. There actually uh, includes iodine. And one thing we'll find is that if you have too much iodine in the system, that can actually lead to hypothyroidism. We kind of cover that a little bit in physio. Um, but essentially, these kids were having too good of absorption of this betadine through the skin because they had a very underdeveloped stratum corneum. They were to get too much iodine in the system that shut down their thyroids, right? So now all of a sudden, you have an infant with hypothyroidism. Um, so that would be one reason we why we wouldn't do this. Um, did I mention the, uh, the babies that were testing positive for THC? Did I mention that? Yet? Okay, so um, there's a case where, do you guys know what THC is? Where do you find it at? Yeah, marijuana. So that's a, I, okay, so now I know who's real immersed in that stuff. Just kidding. Um, right, so THC is uh, it's the major psychoactive component in marijuana. Um, and so it was interesting, there's this hospital where they're having these, uh, these mothers are just giving birth, and the babies, you know, they didn't want them to dry out, so they were giving them these lotions. And so one of the things I guess they're doing on, on certain high-risk babies, um, they're doing urine drug screens to detect if the mother was having any kind of like inter, uh, uh, interpartum uh, drug use, essentially, right? And so what they would do is they test these babies, and some of them were actually testing positive for THC. And they're like, okay, well, let's go investigate this, and you know maybe we take the baby away from mom because she was using drugs, whatever it happens to be. They go to the mom, test her, she's negative. Like, well, how is the baby positive? I don't doubt the babies, you know, lighten up 
in the in the NICU. Um, so what they were able to do is they actually went back and they looked at what you know kind of the, the common thread was between all those babies and found out that the solution was kind of the common thing there. And some component of that thing called like an Aveeno uh, type moisturizer, it actually had a, uh, a component to it that actually cross-reacted with the THC assay on the urine drug screen. So they were able to go back and say, okay, well, probably we shouldn't use this moisturizer anymore for these babies. Uh, and they said, okay, well, you guys are obviously mom's not using uh, marijuana, at least at least during that time period. Um, so again, just another example of like very easy, you know, transdermal absorption of, of uh, compounds that can happen with the, with these children. Okay, you're going to find the skin's also very well hydrated. This can help to increase uh, perfusion as well. Um, and then also looking at this ratio of the body surface area to their body mass is significantly increased compared to uh, adult patients, right? So just based on their actual mass, they have a whole lot more body surface area uh, than adult patients. So basically, covering uh, even a small portion of their skin can still be pretty significant for those patients. So um, basically, you can see a lot of toxicity for some of these topically applied drugs. Be very careful here. Um, you know, patients have been given antihistamine lotions, which have resulted in things like seizures and anticholinergic effects from, from that, uh, just due to that increased absorption. Um, they've seen, uh, you guys are familiar with isopropanol. You know another name for that? As rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, um, kids were able to absorb that through the skin and they were able to develop hypoglycemia and lethargy. So basically kind of getting drunk uh, from that. Uh, and again, all due to that transdermal absorption. So be very careful, especially when you're dealing with these, uh, these neonates uh, and young children. Okay. So looking at how their distribution is going to be altered uh, for these young kids. So again, volume distribution relates to the amount of drug in the body to that serum concentration. You guys remember that uh, equation that VD is going to equal that dose that we give divided by the initial concentration. Um, and again, it's that mathematical concept. It's not actually a real physiologic number, but we can relate that I gave this much drug. This is how much I measure in the plasma now. How does that relate to how much drug has been distributed out to the tissues? So we're going to see how kids are going to differ in this regard. So. You know, looking at this, you can see, uh, looking at their distribution sites, uh, notice the total body water, uh, especially early on in life, is going to be much higher than what it's going to be uh, when they are more developed uh, and, you know, kind of an adult. Um, you're also going to see the body fat's going to differ over time. It's going to get more developed uh, as you get a little bit older. And the extracellular water is again, going to also be increased. So I mentioned little kids are basically big bags of water, okay? A lot of total body water. They don't have a ton of fat stores necessarily. And so we're going to see how that can alter those kinetics of the drugs we're, we're mentioning there. So um, again, general factors affecting the, the volume distribution, looking at the lipid solubility of our drugs. We mentioned that things that have a high lipid solubility, they tend to have higher or lower volumes of distribution. <laughs> tend to have higher, right? And so again, that only really holds true for patients that have enough adipose tissue. We're gonna see how that can be differing here. Um, looking at plasma protein binding, what does that do to volume distribution? Yeah, it should decrease it, right? Because if you have albumin or something like that, binding up drugs in the serum, it's not free to be distributed out to the tissue. So that will also lower uh, the amount of drug that you can measure in that plasma. That's what's going to uh, able to uh, lower your volume distribution. Uh, tissue binding is going to have the opposite effect of the serum protein binding by binding up drug out in, in the periphery. Uh, and then again, just all that kind of culminates in like how much peripheral tissue distribution we're going to have here. So um, lots of different disease states can be affecting that volume distribution. So you can find, especially with critically ill states, so if you have like burn victims, if you have edema, all that can be affecting uh, drugs to uh, pretty significant uh, degrees um, based on how that fluid is going to be shifting in the body. So looking at a newborn infant, uh, about 70 to 75 percent of their body weight is considered to be water. OK, um, looking at the extracellular water component, it's going to be much higher in infants than you would see with an adult. So roughly double what you would see there. And they also have less fat tissue. And then overall, they're going to have less muscle tissue as well. I mentioned big bags of water. Uh, normally, you see that kids will uh, typically lose weight over the first couple of days of life. Usually a lot of that is diuresing uh, some of this extra water off from basically from the mob, essentially. Um, but initially, they're going to have a lot, a lot of body water there. And and basically for hydrophilic medications, this means it's going to have a larger volume distribution. Okay, so we're going to see that that's going to be having a pretty big effect on how we dose some of our drugs for our patients. Okay, so basically kids have a bigger bucket for hydrophilic medications. So that means that in order to get the same serum concentration, right? Because again, if I'm using, uh, say, a drug with a narrow therapeutic index, and I want to make sure I'm getting to a, a very specific blood level, uh, that means I need to give a bigger dose on a milligram per kilogram basis than I would for an adult, say a smaller bucket there. Okay, because again, less of that drug that I administer to that child is going to remain there in the serum, the more of it's going to be distributed out to the tissues to the extracellular um, body fluid, right? So you can see that some drugs uh, on a mg per kilo basis, I have to give a bigger dose to uh, an infant than I would to an adult patient. So I'll show you an example of that in a second.
Plus, it's really cute. The little kid's in a bucket. <laughs> My kid doesn't really tolerate that much, very much. I try to put them in boxes and stuff and drive around, but uh. Anywho, so looking at uh, an example, gentamicin. Does anyone know what type of drug this is? Yeah, it's an antibiotic. So it's a, it's a very good gram-negative killer. Um, we use this very often in, in ICUs and things like that when you need to really get rid of gram-negative bacteria. But um, it's a very hydrophilic medication. It's a relatively low volume of distribution. And so you can see for an adolescent or adult patient, around 0.2 to 0.3 liters per kilogram. And what do we say was a cutoff for a large volume of distribution? You know, so one liter per kilogram is considered to be anything above that would be a large volume of distribution. So you notice here that because the body water is increasing as you get younger and younger, they have uh, roughly you know uh, you know double the volume of distribution for gentamicin. Uh, and a neonate that you see for an adult patient. And this is one we use very frequently uh, for, especially with like rule out sepsis, uh, or if you have a, like a, a newborn who is uh, very sick and we need, you know, we're not really sure where the actual infection is, gentamicin is one of the go-to drugs that we use because we want to make sure we can wipe out all those gram-negative bugs. So looking at the actual dose, in order to achieve the same uh, blood levels, to make sure that we're actually getting high enough levels to kill those bacteria, you have to give a significantly higher dose here, right? So say four to five mix per kilo per dose versus just one to two, okay? So if you ever see that and you're looking at your, uh, if you're looking at your Lexicomps or your Micromaticses or something, and you're like, well, why does the, the you know, peach patient on a make per kilo basically get a bigger dose than you see for the adult? That's oftentimes what the case is, is that the volume of distribution is different. And when you're shooting for those same plasma levels, you have to adjust your dose uh, to make sure they get that same level. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. Also, you can see uh, decreased plasma proteins, so they're going to have uh, lower protein binding, lower protein stores, so that can also affect and increase your volume distribution. Um, you can also have issues where you can have endogenous compounds that compete for protein binding, so you have bilirubin. And a really good example of this is a drug called uh, ceftriaxone. Has anyone heard of that one before? What the brand name is? It's called rocephin. Right? Maybe someone's ever gotten like a shot of rocephin before. Yeah. Um, you had like a little too much fun one weekend, and then you, I'm just kidding. Um, so basically, rocephin or ceftriaxone is a type of cephalosporin, so it's kind of a cousin to penicillin. I'm um, just trying to get you guys a little bit kind of uh, acclimated to some of these drugs as we kind of talk about them. But uh, essentially, it can uh, compete for the same binding spots as bilirubin. And so what you see is that ceftriaxone has a contraindication, meaning you do not want to give it during the first 30 days of life. And the reason for that is because if you have ceftriaxone being given, it will displace that bilirubin. And then if you have too much bilirubin in the blood, what happens? They get jaundice, yeah. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, too much bilirubin in the blood is never going to be a good thing. Um, so we go ahead and we will not use that drug. We have an alternative type of drug in that same category that you can use instead. And then after that 28 days, once they've kind of started to clear some of that bilirubin, um, now the binding issue is not such a big deal, and you can start to use rocephin again. So that's going to be very important. And there's certain age-specific contraindications uh, for certain drugs. And so there's always a reason for that. Uh, it's usually never arbitrary. Um, another good example would be a drug called phenytoin. Uh, this one is used for seizures uh, pretty frequently. Um, and this one, because uh, these neonates uh, especially are going to have lower uh, tissue proteins that are available to bind the drug, that means you can have increased free fractions of it. So for instance, phenytoin usually likes to be 90% bound to proteins, right? So if I were to measure uh, the total level uh, within the blood, 90% of that's bound to, say, albumin, 10% of that's going to be free. Okay, the free fraction, remember, uh, remember we said, is going to be the pharmacologic active version. Okay, So what happens is that they have lower tissue binding spot or lower uh, protein binding spots in the blood. Um, what does that do to that free fraction? Does it get bigger or smaller? should be getting bigger, right? Because uh, less of it can be bound to the protein, so more of it's going to be free, which means that you can have a higher amount of it able to act on the receptors that it works on, and you can end up seeing a toxicity potentially. Right? So I think one of the things you have to worry about is how much serum proteins does it actually have, and is it sufficient enough to bind up the amount of drugs so that when we dose it, uh, they're not going to have problems with it. right? So again, looking at some of the different proteins, you'll notice some of them can actually be increased uh, in the early stages of life. Um, uh, or at least in the neonatal period, things like albumin is going to be reduced, um, total proteins in general that are going to be reduced, and then we'll eventually kind of get more uh, near adult patterns as they kind of get closer to, to children. Okay. All right. Um, looking at uh, metabolism, how are children going to be affected by this? So again, looking at uh, 
increasing gestational age and postnatal age is going to increase the child's ability to metabolize different drugs. Um, you're going to find that in a lot of cases, especially with the preemies, uh, they're going to be uh, they're going to have immature enzymes or they may not be uh, producing sufficient amounts of enzymes to be metabolizing all of these drugs. But that gets better as they get older. Uh, this can also be uh, apparent when they have changes in hepatic blood flow, less blood getting to the liver, less drugs that can be metabolized there. It's just not being delivered at that point. So as we get older, we're going to see increased quantity and quality of those enzymes. We'll show you some graphs of that in just a second. Um, disease states can be affecting this. They have you know any kind of like uh, congenital issues or they have liver failure uh, early on. And then we'll look at uh, some issues of enzyme induction and also uh, inhibition, right? So this is usually our drug interactions uh, that you can run into there. So um, looking at phase one reactions, uh, remember that was phase one reactions. What's the point of phase one reactions? Really adding something onto the molecule. No, we're not doing that for phase one, right? We're basically just usually uncovering some kind of functional group or making it more polar. Um, again, a lot of these things, uh, not everything has to go from phase one to phase two. Sometimes it just does phase one. Sometimes it just does phase two. Sometimes it'll be both. Um, again, remember those specific examples like oxidation is a big one. You guys remember like the main enzyme system I wanted you to remember for phase one? Yep, so P450 is uh, the big one uh, uh, we want to be remembering here for this oxidation uh, example here. Again, looking at cytochrome P450, you're going to notice that this is the most important pathway, but roughly, uh, you know, with a full-term infant, is only going to have half the activity of the whole system uh, as that of adults, okay? Uh, that means that in some cases, you may be underproducing uh, certain enzymes. Other ones may be in a little bit higher abundance. It kind of differs based on the type of enzyme we're doing. And remember, you know, you can have 3A4, you can have 2C9, 2D6, all kinds of different isoenzymes of SIP. Uh, and so they will be expressed at different levels and be maturing at different rates in those children. And remember that different drugs will be metabolized by different SIP enzymes. So you're going to find that there's different uh, dosing uh, related back to how that child should be developing and how well they can metabolize it. So for example, phenytoin, uh, I mentioned used for seizures. By the time they're one year postnatal age, they have roughly two to five times the ability to metabolize that drug uh, as an adult patient. So what do you think I need to do to that dose uh, to make sure the patient gets enough drug? Yeah, I have to, I have to increase this. I have to give them more drug, or at least more frequently, uh, in order to make sure they have enough drug in the system. Otherwise, they're going to be metabolizing it too quickly. So sometimes you'll see that you're going to, uh, as a, like a neonate, you may give a small dose. You have a much bigger dose as a child. And as an adult, you may go back down to uh, closer to like the infant doses, right? So um, other examples of drugs that may be having a uh, reduced amount of uh, metabolism, things like chloral hydrate. This is really a kind of an old school uh, sedative agent we don't really use anymore. You guys ever heard of a Mickey Fen or slipping someone a Mickey? Kind of an old term, but basically it's kind of like, uh, like I guess, a, the prototype for, for date rape, essentially. Um, there's like an old, I guess if you guys are familiar with Seinfeld, they talk about it there. But essentially, uh, somebody in a bar with slip coral hydrate, it, it causes them to become very, very sedate. Uh, but we used to use it on kids because it was a very good uh, sedative agent for them. And so they would have impaired absorption, may have uh, kind of more pronounced or prolonged uh, uh, sleepiness from that, which could be problematic and if you need them to wake up for you. Um, you can also find that things like certain drugs may not be metabolized as quickly due to uh, decreased plasma esterase activity. So things like certain anesthetics may stick around for longer, which can cause issues with the heart and, and CNS problems. So just be aware, there's going to be lots of different examples based on uh, the uh, specific metabolizing um, pathway. Uh, and they're going to be developing at different rates depending on uh, where the child's at as far as development goes. Okay. So um, mentioned that, for instance, uh, CYP2E1, which is an important one uh, that we see used to metabolize alcohol to some degree, um, within hours, you're going to notice that activity will actually increase pretty rapidly. Okay? Um, CYP2D6 is going to be detectable soon after birth, um, but you won't get uh, appreciable levels of 2C, uh, 2C uh, enzymes or 3A4 uh, until about the first month or so. So you notice here how they would have pretty impaired absorption uh, or uh, metabolism of those 3A4 type drugs until, you know, say, the first month or so. And then as they get a little bit older, you're going to see 3A4 activity may even exceed adult levels. So again, it's going to be different for every enzyme. And a lot of that dosing that you look at in your drug references have already taken that into account. They're already kind of factoring this in. So that way you can uh, make sure that you're dosing your, your patient appropriately. Okay. Um, looking at phase two reactions, the net effect here, again, remember we're adding on some sort of group onto uh, the molecule to make it more water soluble, either like glucuronide or um, a methyl group or something like that. Uh, basically, uh, getting ready for either excretion in the kidneys or sometimes in the bile. Again, remember sulfation, methylation, glucuronide conjugation. These are all good examples of phase two reactions here. You'll find um, that, for example, uh, some pathways are going to be more pronounced or even better 
for children when they're born uh, than uh, they would be later on in life. So for instance, the sulfation pathway, or basically we're adding a sulfate group onto a molecule, um, we find that this is very well developed and very functional at birth. And this is an important pathway for uh, acetaminophen. And one of those things that we worry about, obviously, with acetaminophen is, is what? If you give too much of it. Yeah, liver damage, right? So we don't want to cause that in our kids. And what's nice is they already have a kind of a built-in uh, ability to uh, kind of metabolize that drug and get rid of it. So they actually can tolerate bigger doses on a mic per kilo basis than an adult actually could, okay? So for instance, you know, if we're at the poison center uh, and you're dealing with like, say, a one-year-old, mom calls them, she says, oh my gosh, my kid drank all of the acetaminophen, this whole bottle of it, right? You think, well, how's that even possible? But was this stuff tasting better? I mean, I don't know how you guys' medication tasted when you were a kid, it was awful, right? Nowadays it's like orange and grape and it tastes great. Um, so of course they want to drink it. So uh, they'll drink an entire bottle of it. And so they're like, oh my gosh, my kid's going to die. They're going to have liver failure. And so you look at it and say, okay, well, um, the, the cut point where I would actually be concerned for this kid is actually 200 milligrams per kilogram. If they got more than that, then I say they're at risk for liver uh, toxicity. For an adult patient, it's like 150 mg per kilo, right? Mm -hmm. So I can tolerate, you know, about a third more uh, drug uh, than those adult patients can because that sulfation pathway is so good, right? So in some cases, they're actually more protected. Other cases, it's going to be underdeveloped and they may be more at risk for toxicity. So, um, you know, just some other examples you can see here, uh, things like morphine or chloramphenicol, they're going to have pretty underdeveloped ability to um, uh, actually uh, do things like glucuronic conjugation, which may make it more difficult to metabolize those drugs. So things like morphine, if it sticks around for too long, or like to see respiratory depression, you know, problems like that. So. Um, Another good example is glycine conjugation. Um, we have to make sure that we don't use, especially for infants uh, in that first month of life, um, benzyl alcohol, right? So for, for the neonates, we don't use benzyl alcohol. It's a preservative that you find in um, uh, certain drugs. So especially like IV medications, if you want to have like multiple doses used out of that, they put preservatives in it to prevent bacteria from growing. Uh, and benzyl alcohol is one we, we use uh, for like adult <laughs> patients. You know, uh, neonates, they can't actually metabolize this benzyl alcohol very well. So they get this problem uh, where they get this kind of this gasping syndrome that occurs from having too much of this building up. And so you have to use preservative free medications for those uh, neonates. So that's one really important dose in consideration is what type of actual product can I use preservative free versus not. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to excretion, uh, again, most drugs uh, end up being renal excreted for the most part, uh, and you're going to find that renal function for these uh, young kids is going to be, uh, especially if they're preemie, are going to be pretty underdeveloped. Um, they're going to have a decreased number of uh, size and the quality of the glomeruli. We're going to talk a lot about those uh, in physio today. Um, you may see issues with protein binding affecting how well they're going to be able to clear, because um, you'll notice that drugs that are bound to serum proteins, uh, they're not free to be eliminated through the kidneys, right, because they're going to be bound up and they're going to stain the blood, uh, essentially. Uh, renal blood flow can be affected by this, especially with like cardiac kids who may have some uh, problems with, uh, with blood flow already. Um, looking at disease states, nephrotoxic medications, which can cause kidney injury, um, and then also changes in urine pH and urine drug concentration. So we'll get some of these examples uh, in just a minute here. So looking at GFR, or glomerular, glomerular filtration rate, um, you're going to notice that in the first week of life or so, uh, these uh, neonates are going to have an increased serum creatinine. And why do you guys think that would be the case? As you mentioned, they don't really have a ton of muscle mass. You know, muscles needed to make creatinine. Mm, that could be one reason. Maybe they're not filtering out very well. Where did that creatinine come from, though? The mom, yeah. So actually, early on, you can't use their serum creatinine that first week because you're actually measuring mom's serum creatinine. Okay? So it's one of those things that can be a little bit misleading there. But um, after they can start to clear that out on their own, you're going to notice the renal function will start to pick up over that first one to two weeks of life or so. Um, and again, when they're the more premature they are, oftentimes the more immature their, their kidneys are going to be. So again, uh, just more immature nephrons, not really functioning super well. Um, and so you're going to have issues with electrolyte balances, fluid balances, all kinds of issues there, um, and even reduce uh, renal blood flow, uh, which can all lead to decreased filtration and elimination of these drugs. So uh, just an example, looking at uh, GFR, looking at a term infant versus uh, preterm, uh, and again, looking at the different sizes there. So again, if you only had like, say, a two kilogram or one and a half kilograms, a very, very tiny little baby, um, looking at how their uh, renal function is going to be over time. So again, you notice that even by the time that you're, you know, say two weeks out from birth, uh, the preterms have, have you know, especially the really small ones, are really not even caught up to the term babies at, at birth there, right? So it can take some time for them to really kind of catch up. Uh, and so we mentioned if we can't use the serum creatinine as a uh, good marker for function, how else could you monitor how well their kidneys are working? 
Yeah, uh, your output's going to be the other big thing we're going to look at there. Um, and so a good rough number to have there is if a kid's producing more than one ml per kilo per hour of urine, that typically means you have pretty decent, um, at least decent enough GFR, good renal output. So. Uh, again, just looking at their actual GFR number, so looking at like a neonate, uh, maybe about 30 to 40 or so, uh, and as it increases around the time they're about six months older, so they're, they're close enough to adult patterns, um, that this is going to be less of a concern. Unless they have other, some kind of renal issue um, that they're, they're dealing with at the time. But by the time they're about six months old or so, they have pretty decent renal function. And so what do you think this does to either our drug dose or how often we give a drug? You give more drug, less drug, give it more often, less often. Less often, yeah, so that's you, you, the, the big thing there. So oftentimes, you're going to notice that when it comes to elimination of a drug, um, it's going to be more often affecting how frequently you give a drug versus the actual dose you need to give, right? Because a dose is going to get us up to a certain level to be therapeutic, uh, but then the question is how quickly are they going to actually be eliminating that drug? And that's all going to be related really, really back to their either metabolism and the excretion of it. So. A uh, good example, again, is gentamicin. We mentioned it's a water-soluble medication. Uh, gets almost uh, completely eliminated through the kidneys. Um, looking at a, a neonate less than one week old, you notice their half-life is around, say, anywhere between three to like 11 and a half hours. Pretty wide ranging there. Um, you know, one week to one month, starting to go up to about three to six hours. And then as it gets you know, older and older, you know, around that child to, to adolescent phase, you're noticing it's you know, pretty close to adult levels there. So early on, we would have to give gentamicin. Uh, say for like an adult patient, we would give it, say, every eight hours, for instance. Okay, for a neonate, we may have to give that every 24 hours, every 36 hours, every 48 hours, right? You already mentioned we're giving them bigger doses because their volume distribution is different. So you're giving them a bigger dose to get that blood level high enough to kill those bacteria, and then you're only giving it maybe every day, every day and a half or so, in order to allow them to eliminate it, to keep it from building up, because as it starts to build up, then you can see problems like kidney injury, ototoxicity, all kinds of other problems you don't want to have happen. So um, also things looking at uh, tubular secretion, reabsorption, both are going to be pretty significantly decreased in that first year of life. Um, and you can also have some issues with this kind of renal tubular development, especially if they have decreased renal blood flow. Um, they may have an impaired ability to really concentrate urine in the kidneys. We're going to talk a lot about that today, uh, Visio. Um, and then you can also find that uh, they have lower urinary pH values, which can affect how well certain drugs get reabsorbed uh, based on, uh, again, going back to that pKa and the pH of the solution, how that can affect um, how well protonated or unprotonated a, a drug is. So, um, so that's it for the, the main kind of pharmacokinetic differences there. So uh, looking into uh, some of the reasons it can contribute to uh, this kind of diversity in drug response. There's lots of reasons why different kids may respond to drugs differently uh, than other ones, right? So um, for instance, I mentioned that case where certain kids would be ultra metabolizers of CYP2D6. They make a lot of morphine out of codeine and they get really good effects from that, but they also can see respiratory depression versus those that are poor metabolizers. They don't really produce a whole lot of morphine. They don't really get a lot of good effect out of that, right? All that's a pharmacogenic difference we know certain patient populations uh, tend to be more likely to be in one camp versus the other based on their their background right so um, things like african-american patients more likely to be ultra metabolizers of 2d6 caucasian patients more likely to be under metabolizing right so we can look into stuff like that. Um, so looking at their kind of their, their background, looking at the pharmacogenetics. Um, obviously, age is going to be a major factor here. But of course, you can see things like um, what type of other drug treatments are on could be affecting the, the medications you're the effects you're seeing, uh, the food they're receiving. Uh, also looking at things like recreational drugs, more often like in your teenagers and whatnot. Um, but all these can really lead to to variations here. So we're going to talk about a little bit more of these in detail uh, and how we can maybe uh, kind of account for some of these. So I mentioned that CYP2D6 uh, metabolism, um, again, the, especially with those kids where uh, they were post-op from a TNA or having their tonsil, uh, tonsillectomy, uh, again, they already had obstruction uh, when sleeping. That's why they were coming to get the surgery in the first place. Now, after surgery, their throat's more swollen. Uh, they had that respiratory depression from the morphine led to those deaths. So um, again, if we can try to... Uh, have a good idea, say certain patient populations, like, yes, you're more likely to be at risk for this, you can avoid using that drug altogether. Or in some cases, you just don't use the drug at all and you take codeine off your formulary, right? So that's one thing we did uh, over at Nemours. And in some cases, this is where black box warnings will be added onto drugs. So they notice like, hey, these particular patients are really at risk for having this, uh, this outcome, uh, then don't use them in these patients. And that can be put on as kind of like the highest warning that a drug can get, right? So you guys are familiar with black box warnings? This is like, hey, this is big dangerous. Um, don't use this in these patients. Otherwise, you know, um, it's one of those things where, like, you know, if you were to use it inappropriately, uh, you know, the lawyers can come back and say, well, obviously there's a black box warning. Why didn't you know that this could cause QT prolongation and kill your patient or something like that? Really need to uh, take special heed for those black box warnings. <laughs> 
So, um, all right, looking at age-based dosing regimen. So how do we specifically um, dose drugs for our patients? Um, you can do it several different ways. Uh, we'll talk about some of the, the kind of pro, uh, pros and cons of each one as we go forward here. So for example, if you were to dose coding, which again, we wouldn't do nowadays most likely, uh, but some, some kids will still be on it. Um, you can do age-based dosing. They'll say, okay, from two to five, they're gonna get anywhere between two and a half to five milligrams every four to six hours, right? Uh, six to 12, we're gonna give five to 10 milligrams. Uh, and if they're greater than 12, we're gonna use 10 to 20. So the advantage of this is pretty easy to dose, right? So you can just look at the age of the kids, say, okay, I'm gonna give you this much drug. Um, but the, what, what are some of the disadvantages? Yeah, absolutely. I have uh, I have like a 15 year old in the ICU that weighs uh, 13 kilograms. Super tiny, right? Because they have you know congenital issues that led to them not being very well developed. I will have uh, I'm trying to think of any like really the big ones we've seen, but you had two year olds that weigh near 40 pounds already, right? Like they can get very very big, right? Um, or they can go either on either end of the the spectrum there. So because of that, um, age-based age dosing assumes assume everyone's the same, right, in those age groups, and which may work for 90% of your patients, but there's always going to be that 10% or so uh, that kind of fit outside of that. And so you don't want to, um, uh, this can lead to either having underperformance of the drug or overperformance and more likely to see toxicity, okay? So don't use a whole lot of age-based dosing in those cases. So um, looking at, uh, say, neonates and infants using a more of a body weight based approach, this is probably the most common one that we use nowadays. Um, so for example, if you were dosing neonates and infants, say, you know, 20 to 30 mg per kilo per day, divide it Q12, or we do, a, say, for infants, you do 25 to 50. So again, this is already taking into account the differences in development, either how they're metabolizing it or how they're excreting the drug um, to make sure you're getting the right dose and using the right frequency, okay? And say if like for an adult patient, then you would bump it up, say, say between 200 and 500 milligrams every eight. So this would kind of account for going from Q12 to Q8, giving it more frequently. The patients are probably clearing it more uh, more appropriately or more quickly as they get older, right? Um, this is the most common one we're going to be using here um, because, again, it can take into account those differences in weight. Um, obviously, if you have a very obese child or an obese teenager or something like that, um, there's going to be some limits to that because, obviously, you don't want to, one, you don't want to exceed adult dosing. Right, so if I had a, a kid greater than uh, three months and that 50 mg per kilo per day ended up exceeding uh, that standard dose for adults, I wouldn't do that, right? I would just kind of cap it out at the adult dose. That's one of those important things to remember. Never go and exceed the adult dose for those uh, drugs. But you may find that some of those kids may have different med clearance depending on uh, either a congenital issue or some other disease that they develop. Um, so that may lead to problems with, uh, this may not be appropriate for every single patient, but it does work for the great majority of them. Yes, ma'am. I'm talking about all kids. So like yeah, so so for instance, like let's say like uh, fluid boluses, right? So I want to give a fluid bolus to a patient. Um, for like an adult patient, I can go say one to two liters is usually uh, a decent dose for an adult patient, right? Now, for instance, if I had say uh, 120 kilo kid. They came in, which is not completely unheard of. It's a very big kid, but uh, they came in, they would end up being exceeding that two liter dose if I were to use the, the standard dose for fluid bolus. It's 20 mLs per kilo, which is a good number to remember uh, for fluid boluses. But anyway, uh, if they were to exceed that, I would say, well, I don't want to give actually that much. I'm just going to cap it off at the two two liters, right? Or if you're dosing antibiotics for some of those bigger kids, you just cap it off whatever the adult dose is going to be. Okay. So I still do the calculation. I still see what they should get based on the make per kilo amount. And then if that exceeds the adult, I just go ahead and just drop it down to whatever that is. I can't think of any good examples where I would actually go and exceed the adult dose. Um, but yeah, so, and again, like, and if there is no, like, you know, if the adult dose is like an, on a, still based on a mg per kilo amount, there's usually a max dose associated with that, and that's usually what you're going to cap it out as, uh, at as well. Okay. Because again, as the patients get bigger and bigger, at some point it could be mostly muscle mass, but in a lot of cases it's just adipose tissue. Um, and based on the kinetics of, of the drugs, um, that drug is not going to be distributing all out to that adipose tissue necessarily. And so that can affect how much is you know available in the central circulation and that can affect uh, toxicity and whatnot. So that's usually why uh, you don't go too, too high on that. Um, we had one patient where... Um, one of the things we don't really cover in this class so much, but for especially uh, very large patients, um, we have what we can uh, we can use a calculation called ideal body weight, which is based on the sex of the patient and on their height. 
and you get an idea of like ideally they should weigh this much and you compare that with how much they actually weigh you can get kind of an adjusted body weight that's somewhere in the middle right? so there's calculations for that and so we had one kid who uh, she was having necrotizing pancreatitis uh, and so we needed to put her on we basically needed to rest the GI tract so we had to put her on TPN uh, total parenteral nutrition or all our IV, um, all our uh, nutrition is going through the IV and so for her because she ended up being uh, fairly large we had to uh, not give her not dose all of her electrolytes and all of her other things like that based off of her actual weight because all that was adipose tissue we know things like electrolytes don't partition out to that kind of tissue as well as as you would think just based on a mix per kilo basis so we ended up having to dose her based on that adjusted body weight and you, you get a little, little bit closer to what she should actually be getting so um, a little outside of the scope of this but there, there are ways we can kind of handle those uh, larger patients okay. all right so again, looking at the disadvantages uh, of using the body weight. So again, there's potential uh, for overdosing or underdosing, especially in those under uh, overweight kids. Uh, we know this uh, incidence is, is increasing. I uh, unfortunately was one of those really fat kids, and who knows how they're dosing my drugs, but um, I don't know if they're taking that into account or not. It's probably back when they're still using the age-based do uh, dosing there. Okay. Um, another common way to do this would be body surface area or BSA. Uh, and again, you can see uh, we do this a lot for chemotherapy. We'll do this uh, for some other drugs. There's one called corticotropin. Uh, I've already talked about this back in the uh, the endocrine section. You guys remember this drug? It's like adrenal corticotropin. Yeah. So anyway, so it stimulates the uh, basic cortisol production. Uh, and basically, you, you would do it say 150 milligrams per meter squared. Uh, you can do that say I am divided twice a day. So uh, basically, there are several calculations you can use to get the body surface area for the patient. It's important to be consistent in which one you're using. Um, so, you know, if you just find out what institution, you know, whatever calculation your institution is using and make sure you stick with that. Um, but it can be very, very precise, especially if you're dosing uh, very dangerous medications like chemotherapy and things like that. Um, and it limits that potential for overdose based on those kind of overweight children. Right. So that's one, uh, one of the benefits there. Um, it's important that you have the correct height when you're doing that, not just the weight of the patient for the calculations. So it's Sometimes it can be very difficult to estimate length, uh, especially if you're trying to deal with like a, a newborn or a kid who maybe has um, any like issues where they have maybe like spasticity and they, their muscles are contracted in, in a way that makes it difficult to get their height. Uh, so that can lead to some errors there. And again, there's lots of different calculations. So just be consistent with whichever one you're using. We're going to continue on talking about uh, some IV drug administration. I mentioned some issues with site of administration already being important. Um, you know, usually uh, the deeper the IV access you can get, usually the safer it's going to be for the patient. Um, a lot of times those very kind of like really small, thin, kind of superficial veins, they have a tendency to blow essentially or uh, extravasate, uh, which you don't want to have happen. So that can be one issue. Um, you also have to consider like the volume of drug that you're using. So uh, do you think you'd want to use very concentrated drugs or very unconcentrated drugs? Typically, want to use more concentrated because again, if you're thinking about a kid who is, uh, say, you know, a kilo and a half, you know, so not very big, uh, and you're administering, you know, a drug with 10 mL of volume, that could be, you know, pretty large volume for them. You can have diluting out the blood, you can drop their hematocrit, um, it can lead to some problems. So we usually will have very standardized concentrations to make sure that we can give things as concentrated as we can while still being safe. Obviously, too concentrated can be an issue as well, causing damage to the veins and whatnot, or you know, just the actual uh, stability of the drug and things like that. But um, also looking at things like multiple drugs and their corresponding frequency. So how often are patients going to be getting these IV medications? Oftentimes their access is not super great. So you may only have one line and if you have to give multiple medications, some of those drugs may not be compatible with one another. Um, so it can lead to uh, delays in actually getting the meds into the patients. That can be one problem. Um, and again, just like looking at mechanical and technical problems, we'll look at some examples of those in a second. Um, but it's really, really important that, um, you know, especially when you're doing like a neonate, you just don't want to hang a liter of saline on them and just let it run, right? Because that can end up leading to uh, fluid overload, pulmonary edema. So we have a lot of uh, uh, hardware that goes along with this to make sure that we're giving the right amount of drugs to these patients. Um, and then we'll also talk about therapeutic drug monitoring in the next section. Uh, but essentially, that's where you're doing blood draws to look at the actual plasma concentration of a drug um, to make sure they're therapeutic. And so if you keep taking blood samples from these patients, what can happen? Yeah, because again, you need a certain amount of blood in order to run those tests, and those really small kids you end up leading to anemia, right? So if you, especially if you're doing other labs uh, for other things, so you try to run uh, as many tests as you can off the one sample, um, but we'll see with therapy drug monitoring, timing is going to be really important for some of these uh, drug levels that we're doing. So. So usually when we're dealing with uh, these patients, we usually have some sort of pump setup uh, that we're going to be using in order to make sure that we're administering uh, the correct amount of drug to the patient, right? Uh, so this is just one type of setup that you could have. Um, and you also have to consider like you know, how much volume 
uh, is going to be looking at all these lines. So especially if you have a, give a drug and uh, the volume is only half a cc or half an ml, um, you know, there's a lot more fluid in this line than, than that amount. So sometimes you have to make sure that you're flushing appropriately to make sure the drug actually makes it to the patient in those cases. But these pumps are programmable to make sure that you only give the right amount of drug to those patients uh, over the right period of time. Because sometimes giving a drug too quickly can also lead to some problems example of a syringe pump. Uh, this is actually the one we use over at Nemours. Uh, this was really, really nice because um, you can program in different libraries, essentially. So obviously, um, some of the meds you would give in the ICU are either more concentrated or they're uh, inherently more dangerous and they need more monitoring uh, than you would say like on the normal med search floor. So because of that, you would have, say, like a med search library, and then you had the ICU library to make sure that the nurses aren't picking the wrong one, getting the wrong concentration, uh, or giving the drug too quickly or too slowly, right? So all that's kind of built into here. You basically put your syringe uh, of full medication uh, into here, and then you just, uh, the pump will basically kind of pull itself in and administer that drug uh, through the line. Um, so that's one thing we do to make sure that we are administering these drugs as safely as we can um, because they are such an at-risk population. So we've had issues as well where, um, for instance, a drug had changed concentration. Um, basically, the doc had ordered one type of concentration and then switched it over, and the nurse never got the clue on that. So she ended up giving the wrong concentration uh, and ended up giving way too big of a dose uh, of medication to a patient. So you can see there's some inherent issues with that. So that's why it's important to make sure that when they're reading that, that everything matches up. So to make sure that the concentration is the same, uh, the dose is the same, everything is right. So when they program it, the patient gets the right drug, right? Um, Oral administration, I mentioned, is already a challenge uh, when dealing with pediatric patients. I never really had a, a good appreciation for that until I had my own. Um, but, you know, just find some random kid if you want to try to give drugs to them um, and see how easy it is. <laughs> Probably not the best thing to do. Maybe maybe in the clinical setting, it's a little bit yeah, better. But um, look at things like the dosage forms that you're giving. Um, what do you think, you know, especially for small kids, what's the most common dosage form that we use, do you think? Hmm? Uh, so a teaspoon, yeah, so as far as measurements go, but what do you put into a teaspoon? Yeah, liquids. So use suspension, solutions. Um, that's probably the most common way because it's going to be easiest for those patients to take it. Um, obviously, you have to look at things like the sensory appeal of the dosage form. Um, you know, if the texture is wrong or if the taste is wrong. That's why if you go to like, you know, CVS or Walgreens, they have those flavoring stations where you can make it taste like bubblegum or watermelon or whatever the kid is going to take. You try to make it taste as close to that so that way they'll actually take the drug. Um, so uh, other things you have to consider is the, the measuring devices that we're using. So you mentioned a teaspoon. And so how much is a teaspoon? Okay, you know it's five mLs. Who who else knew a teaspoon was five mLs? Yeah, not everyone though, right? Um, so imagine if you were an adult, if you were a, a new parent, um, you may not know that either. How much is in a, a tablespoon? 15. Yeah, a tablespoon is fifteen mLs. So again, the dosing can be uh, can be tough if you don't know those volumes. Um, and also, if I go and buy a spoon from say Walmart and then go buy one from IKEA, are those going to contain the same volume? No, they really don't, right? And I can't eyeball a spoon and say, like, well, this looks like a tablespoon or tea. There's no exactness to that. Um, so what we're doing nowadays is moving away from using teaspoons and tablespoons and dosing everything in mLs, right? Um, so when you guys are writing prescriptions for your patients, you can it's fine to write, give 20 milligrams. But if the solution comes as a certain concentration, you need to tell the parent how many mLs they're actually going to give to the patient. And we have dosing syringes you can draw that up in to make sure you get the right amount, right? So especially with like antibiotics or if you're giving you know, heart medications, things like that, you need to be exact with that stuff. And that's where the dosing syringes are, are coming in handy here, right? So even like for things like um, Tylenol and ibuprofen, they're really kind of common over-the-counter ones. Even they're moving away from teaspoons and tablespoons because of the inherent dosing problems that they were running into. You know, patients get, you know, threefold overdose or underdose, depending if they switch a teaspoon to a tablespoon, if you didn't know the difference, right? And of course, you know, like how, uh, how much training do parents get before they leave the hospital with a, with a newborn? Yeah, like don't shake the baby. Like they just look to see, okay, it looks like there's a car seat in the car. And that's it. And then you have a little person that you're responsible for. I'm just like, this seems way too dangerous. Uh... So yeah, so there's no training courses really. So uh, that, that's why they need to, you know, make sure that you as a healthcare provider are educating them appropriately. Make sure they have the tools to, to succeed when they need to give meds to their, their kids. Um, drug food interactions can be a big thing, uh, especially with, like binding of certain medications. So certain things like, you know, fluoroquinolones like Cipro or uh, 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 Levaquin, um, they end up being bound up by calcium. So again, if their kids drink a lot of milk, um, that can be a problem where they may not be getting actual good absorption of the drugs. And then you have to look at inactive ingredients. Um, very frequently, kids will have uh, intolerances to certain things like um, certain dyes or certain inactive ingredients in the product. So it's important to consider, you know, do they have a reaction to the drug itself or to something that's in the formulation, right? So a lot of times we have to carry things like dye-free formulations to make sure that kids don't have a reaction uh, to the dyes and they can still receive the medication, okay?
One other thing to consider is that when you have something like a, uh, I guess, what's the difference between a solution and a suspension? Isn't it? Yeah, so suspension is basically, it's, you can mix it to make a homogenous solution, but if you let it uh, sit out, it, the drug will just kind of sit to the bottom, right? Um, so you, it's really important to tell patients to do what with those? Shake them up, right? So you can run into problems over there was like one patient who uh, was on phenytoin. Phenytoin comes as a, as a suspension, uh, and basically the mom was not shaking it up, and so they were giving the drug uh, to the patient uh, throughout the month, and they noticed like, man, the kid was having seizures all throughout the month, and then right when they get to the end of it, uh, all of a sudden the kid is like completely snowed. The kid's, you know, lethargic and is not able to walk right. And when it turned out it happens, the mom was giving no drug, no drug, no drug. And then when you get down to the bottom where all that drug was sitting there, now they get way too much drug all at the same time. Right? So that's really, really important why shaking is, is uh, important. That way you can get everything mixed up. Patient gets a good um, uh, standard dose there. Right? So little things you may not consider uh, at first glance. Okay, uh, so when prescribing meds for these kids, make sure you obtain a current weight. Uh, oftentimes, you know, patients will come in and ask the parents, and they're like, oh, I think they're like 10 pounds. That may have been the last pediatrician visit. Uh, may not be re reflective of how much they actually weight nowadays. Uh, so make sure you get uh, as up-to-date weight as you can. Um, check with available references. It's not uncommon for us to check two or three different references to make sure that we're dosing patients appropriately based on, you know, uh, all the unique things about that patient. Um, and then also just uh, when you're counseling patients, you're educating them, make sure that you're providing, you know, uh, specific uh, child appropriate language, um, especially with like teenagers and stuff like that. Like they want to be more in control. Like they want to uh, uh, have some some agency there. So like make sure you're talking with them uh, appropriately. Obviously, like, you know, really tiny kids, you're not going to be able to communicate. Make sure the parents actually understand what's going on. Because, um, again, they may not have any kind of medical literacy whatsoever. And so you may need to talk to them almost like they're like a teenager, right? Uh, they don't know any better. Um, so anywho, so those are the main things uh, to consider there. So let's do some drug dosing calculations. Who's ready for math? Love math, thank you. All right, so I need it here. So um, these are very common things. It's, it's important to get into a habit of understanding how to do these calculations to make sure you're dosing your patient appropriately. So let's say, for instance, we have a, a kid, a 15 kilo kid, uh, that is going to be uh, dosed with amoxicillin, a penicillin type antibiotic, uh, for acute otitis media. Okay, it's a pretty common prescription you write for. It. And the kid's gonna get 90 milligrams per kilogram divided twice a day. And we know that the uh, suspension comes in 400 milligrams per 5 mLs. So how much should this child receive per dose? So how would we go about doing that calculation? So let's look at the next slide and get all the answers. Is that what you want to do? Well, if you cheat, that's one way. Okay. So let's say we're going to see, well, what, what's the dose that the patient should receive per day? Okay, so we can get that information first. And again, if you have the weight in pounds, it's really, really important you consider uh, uh, convert that over to kilograms, right? Um, so I mentioned that six-week-old that came in um, uh, to the ER in, in SVT. Um, that weight, we basically, the kid was, you know, an emergent case. We had to throw him onto the bed. Uh, we didn't actually throw him. We gently laid him on the bed. Um, <laughs> But those beds, those hospital beds, they have scales built into them, but they're only good down to a certain amount. And this kid was like four pounds or something. Or I'm sorry, he was a uh, like eight pounds, some, some odd ounces. Uh, and so basically we were like, well, how much does the kid weigh? Getting that from the parents. And they said, you know, 10 pounds, seven ounces, right? And so our job was then to convert it back over to kilograms to make sure that we're dosing everything uh, based on what our references are, okay? Do you guys know how you get from pounds to kilograms? You divide by 2.2. What if you have like eight pounds and so many of our ounces? Oh boy, we do that. How many uh, how many ounces in a pound? Sixteen, right? So you take the ounces, you take how many ounces they are, divide that by sixteen. And that's basically the the person, you know, the the decimal point of a, a pound they are. Uh, you factor that in, divide it by two point two, and you get your kilograms. Okay. So always consider the the ounces there and make sure you're you're uh, accounting for that. Because again, um, very small amounts. This kid was like four point three kilos uh, when you end up doing the math for it. And so even a small amount of uh, difference when we did that conversion would have led to far different drug doses the kid would have gotten okay so anywho in this case we don't have to do that conversion but we have uh, say 15 uh kilograms times 90 mg per kilo per day right and so that's going to equal out to a total the kid should receive uh 1350 milligrams of amoxicillin per day okay um then you have to divide it by 13 or divide that 1350 by two Right, because again, the, uh, you have to be very careful when you're reading these to make sure that um, you're figuring out, like, you know, okay, does it say, you know, 90 mg per kilo per dose given twice a day, or is it 90 mg per kilo per day divided BID? Like, those are kind of important things to consider um, because if you write those prescriptions wrong, 
or if you read it incorrectly, that can lead to some big differences there. So for instance, one uh, error I actually just caught this past Friday, um, the radiology uh, tech was writing for contrast. It's supposed to be IV contrast the patient was going to get for like a CT scan. And so the dose she meant to put in was 100 mLs, which she accidentally put in when um, she must have mistyped something, but it came over as 100 mLs per kilo per dose. So now all of a sudden you multiply that out, the kid's going to get like five liters of contrast, which is way too much contrast. The kid would basically be uh, made only of contrast at that point. Um, so I went over there, I was like, do, do you want to change that? And she's like, oh, I guess. Okay, you should probably change that. But anywho, um, so we got the order fixed over. So be really careful in looking to see, like, is it per day, is it per dose? Get all that figured out because you, you can have huge errors if you, if you don't catch that. So this kid, uh, you end up taking that 1350 divided by two, and then you get that 675 milligrams per dose. Okay. So then is that what you just write on the prescription? The kids get 675 twice a day. What do you do from there? Yeah. Now you gotta figure out how many mLs the kid's actually gonna be getting, right? Is that on the next slide? There we go. Okay, so now that take that 675. Um, oftentimes this is kind of confusing because the a lot of the drugs will they'll show their concentrations as per five mLs, because again, that's a teaspoon. Essentially, so we would divide that out and then you get amoxicillin comes as at 80 milligrams per mL. You get that 675 divided by 80, and then you get a total dose of 8.4 mLs twice a day. Okay, so 8.4 mLs per dose. So again, get some practice with doing these calculations because it's a very frequent thing you'd have to do. A lot of times a computer system will do it for you, so it kind of cheats, but should you ever have to write a, a hand prescription, you'll have to do it yourself, right? I'll never forget one of our uh, one night, one of our um, uh, relatively new ER docs uh, was, was attending and our computer system went out and so she's like, well, I have to write a prescription. I said, okay, well, here's the paper. Go ahead and write a prescription. She goes, I've never had to handwrite a prescription. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so let's go through and here, here's the name and here's the date of birth. And basically I had to go through step by step. Um, but you guys will have lots of practice with that before you leave here. So don't worry about that. You may never have to do it again, but you'll at least have practice. Um, so let's say, for instance, we were going to dose uh, an 18 kilo kid uh, who's going to need ranitidine or Zantac, it's a common over-the-counter uh, H2 blocker or histamine receptor 2 blocker uh, for his GERD symptoms. Uh, we're going to dose it at 4 mg per kilo per day, divided BID, and then uh, the ranitidine syrup that we have is going to come as a 15 milligrams per mL. So based on this, how much do they receive per dose? What do you think? So we're, Okay, so what are the, what's the first steps we're going to do? So 18 times 4, so that's going to be, I'm going to do it right here, 72. Okay, and then what do you do with that number? So, yeah, so first you're going to, because you want to figure out how much they're going to get per dose, right? So you can take that 72 divided by 2, because they're going to get it twice a day, right? That BID is twice a day. So they're getting 36 milligrams per dose, right? Now what do I do with that? Yeah, so notice this one doesn't come as per 5 ml, so I don't have to do that extra step. I can just divide that out. But make sure you're um, keeping all your numbers straight and, and uh, make sure you're including all the steps as needed. I would divide that by 15, and I get the kid should get 2.4 ml, right? You usually round within 10% or so, so oftentimes I'll try to round to the nearest ml or uh, the nearest thing that kind of makes sense. Um, but 2.4 ml is pretty easy to, to measure on a dosing syringe, um, and so that would be good to do. So again, the prescription would say 2.4 ml twice a day uh, of the 15 milligram per ml solution. It's important to make sure that the concentrations are being uh, kept in line because certain things like certain antibiotics may have different concentrations, right? And so that can lead to, if you don't uh, delineate that on your prescription, it goes into the pharmacy, they may not know which one to fill and they have to call you up and make sure they, they get the right one, okay? Right. Let's say we have a patient who is getting, uh, 12 kilo patients getting trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole. Does anyone know what drug that is? Bactrim. You ever heard of that one? You use it a lot for UTIs or certain skin infections. Um, let's say that we're giving it for, for cellulitis for this child. Uh, they're going to get four milligrams of TMP per kilo per dose twice a day. Okay, so oftentimes when you have combination drugs, you're going to find that they will dose it based off of one of the active components. So in this case, that's uh, short for trimethoprim. So basically, that's uh, there are two different antibiotics that have two different mechanisms, uh, but we're going to dose it based off that trimethoprim component there. So in this case, how would you go about getting the dose? So 12 times 4, right? So they're getting basically how many milligrams of trimethoprim per dose? Yeah, 48. Okay, so what do I do after that? Uh, do I divide it by two? 
You don't have to divide it by two in this case because look, it's uh, per kilo per dose, right? So I already don't have to do that division there because I'm not getting the total daily dose. That's actually my already per dose amount there. So I take that 48 and then I need to figure out how much uh, of the concentration of that trimethoprim I have in that solution. So it comes as a suspension. Uh, so I'm gonna shake it up real good first before I measure it out. And I do 200 milligrams of sulfamethoxazole and 40 milligrams uh, per five mLs of that trimethoprim. So how would I divide that out then? Yeah, basically 40 divided by 5. Right? Make sure you're looking at the right component. So you do 40 divided by 5, which is 8. And so I would take that initial 48, 48 divided by 8, and you get how much? 6 mLs. So yeah, the patient ended up receiving 6 mLs twice a day in that case. Okay. So that's a little bit tricky with like, you know, the per dose uh, or the per day and you know, things like that. So you might want to make sure you kind of read those carefully to make sure you're dosing uh, patients correctly. Yes, ma'am. So you don't need that because again, you're only dosing based off the trimethoprim component. Okay, so that'll still be represented on the bottle. You'll still see that, but you're not actually dosing it based off the sulfamethoxazole because it's a fixed ratio. That 200 milligrams and 40 milligrams per five, like uh, the sulfamethoxazole dose is going to stay um, in the correct ratio to the trimethoprim. It's a combo drug, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, um, you would never see either one of those uh, separate. You sometimes get trimethoprim on its own, but usually you'd see those together. Everyone with me still? Um, the answer would be six mLs. The kid would get twice a day. All right. So let's say um, we have a 20 kilo kid who is receiving two teaspoons of acetaminophen four times a day for fever. Uh, the usual dose is 15 mg per kilo per dose. Acetaminophen suspension comes as 160 per five. Is this child being dosed appropriately? So the parent comes up and says, hey, I'm giving them two teaspoons. Is this right? Sometimes we get those kind of questions. So the first thing we should do is, a yeah, figure out if they're actually giving a teaspoon. Let's assume, yes, the teaspoon is correct. Now would be how much uh, volume is the kid getting? Yeah, the kid would be getting a total of 10 mLs because two teaspoons would be uh, five and five. So it'd be a total of 10 there. Okay. So then we would say, okay, well, how much a drug is that? So you take that 10 mLs and you multiply it by what? So look at our concentration of the acetaminophen. So that would be 160 divided by 5 equals, yeah, 32. That's a kind of a common one. You'll kind of, it's, a, it's a weird concentration, but you'll kind of, you'll remember sort of that sort of stuff if you do kids a lot. Basically, it's 32 milligrams per ml. So I would take that 10 mLs times 32. Get, yeah, so the kid's getting 320 milligrams. Per dose, right? He's getting that four times a day. So I'll take that 320 and then divide it by. So the kid's getting uh, that 320 milligrams every dose, but he's getting it four times a day. Then you figure out the kid's getting the right amount of drug per dose. So what I would do is now incorporate the kid's weight. So I do 320 divided by. Okay, so I do 320 divided by 20. Now to figure out how many mix per kilo the kid's getting, right? So then that would be 16 milligrams per kilogram the kid's getting, which is pretty close to 15. Okay, so you can do some rounding and that's okay. Uh, again, usually 10% rounding or so is, is appropriate for most of those kids, especially like older kids. Um, they're a little bit bigger. 10% uh, rounding is, is totally fine for those drugs. So in this case, the kid, yes, you could say, yes, mom, you're, you are dosing this appropriately based on the kid's weight. All right. Okay, um, some other things to remember. Uh, so as far as dosing for fluid boluses go, this is really good information to keep in mind. Um, you'll hit this multiple times through my courses and, and other courses as well. So this is why it's good to cover it here. Um, a fluid bolus for a child is typically gonna be 20 mLs per kilo. Okay, it's a good number to remember. Uh, and then uh, oftentimes you're gonna, they'll get like a fluid bolus say in the ER, say they're coming in for nausea vomiting, and then you'd end up giving them maintenance fluids afterwards. Okay, so maintenance fluids is going to uh, determine how much you're going to get per hour. You can use this very handy rule. It's called the 421 rule. I'll probably hammer you with this for from now until forever, so you guys will remember this very easily for, for your rotations. Um, but the 421 rule is is a good way to get maintenance fluids for a patient, feeds patient especially. Um, but for the first 10 kilos of that patient's weight, you dose 4 mLs per kilo per hour. Okay, so that would mean for the first 10. So if a kid weighed 10 kilos, how much fluid should they get per hour? 40. They get 40, right? Absolutely. So they get 40 uh, mLs per hour. Uh, for the second 10 kilos, they would end up getting 2 mLs per kilo per hour. Okay, so it would be 40 to start with for the first 10, and then you add on an additional 2 mLs per kilo per hour for the next 10 kilos. Okay? 
So then a kid that weighed 20 kilos would get how much per hour? Yeah, they're going to be getting 60, right? Um, and then for every subsequent kilogram, they get one ml per kilo per hour. Okay. So if I had a kid who weighed, say, let's just do the, the calculations here. So for an eight kilo infant, how much would they get? So it'd be eight times four. Yeah, so their maintenance rate would be 32 mls per hour, right? Um, what would be their, their uh, fluid bolus? 20 times 8. Yeah, so they end up getting 160 mLs. Uh, again, usually like normal saline or something is usually what you do a, a fluid bolus with. But um, all right, so you get you know, 160 mLs as a fluid bolus, and then you put them on uh, 32 mLs as the maintenance rate afterwards. Okay. Now, how about a 1200 gram neonate? What does that turn into in, in kilograms? Yeah, 1.2, so you do 1.2 times for the fluid bolus, times 20, what do you get? So there's a 1,200 grams, so 1 1.2 kilos times 20. Yeah, you only get 24 mL, so really tiny, so again, this is a very tiny baby, but they get about 24 mL as a fluid bolus, so you guys could probably like spit more than that amount, right? It's very, very tiny amount, so we want to make sure you're giving very exact amounts to these kids, because too much can lead to fluid overload, and that's no good. And then for his maintenance rate, what would that be? So it'd be 1.2 times 4. Yeah, so basically 4.8, like 5 mLs an hour, uh, essentially would be uh, his, his maintenance rate, his or her maintenance rate, right? Uh, let's say we have a 45 kilo adolescent. What would be the fluid bolus? So do 45 times. 20, yeah, so 900 mLs will be the fluid bolus. If you guys have that math done, you can just shout it out, it's totally fine. Um, so 900 mLs will be their fluid bolus, almost a liter, uh, and then what would be their maintenance rate? So for the first 10 kilos of that weight, they would get how much? 40. Yeah, it ends up being 40 mLs per hour. For the second 10 kilos, I mean additional 20, so now they're at 60 mLs per hour. And then now they have an extra 25 kilos we need to account for. Yeah, so another 25 mLs per hour added on to that. So you get a total of 85 mLs per hour. Okay, 85 mLs per hour would be his maintenance rate. He would end up getting 90 uh, or 900 mLs as a fluid bolus. Okay. And how about a 100 kilogram teenager? So the fluid bolus would be 100 times 20. Which ended up being. Yeah, so we end up being two liters. Sometimes we'll actually cap kids out at like one liter, and then if we need to, we can go back and reassess if they need more, then we can give them uh, another liter if we need to. But for adult patients, they get two liters all the time, no problem. Um, as long as they don't have renal issues or fluid overload issues to begin with, they can usually tolerate this pretty well. So that's not usually no problem. Um, and so then what would be their, their maintenance rate of fluids? 140, how'd you get that? Yeah, so for the first 10 kilos, you get 40. For the next 10 kilos, you get another 20, so we're up to 60. And now we have an extra 80 kilograms uh, to factor in. So 80 plus 60, 140 mLs per hour. Okay? Um, you'll get very quick with this, the more, especially if you deal with these patients pretty frequently, because, um, you know, we see a lot of orders come through for this stuff, and I can just do it in my head and be like, okay, this kid should get this much. Okay, this is what the doc ordered. Um, that's correct, right? Um, so you'll get pretty quick with doing this uh, just based on the weights after a while. So do some practices. Um, you know, uh, you will have to do some pretty simple calculations on the test. Um, so that would be something I would expect you to be able to do. Okay. All right. I guess I'm really excited about math. It's important stuff, though. If you don't do it right, you're going to accidentally kill somebody. Uh, this is a uh, another really good thing. Uh, sometimes drugs are expressed in percentages, right? So, you know, lidocaine, uh, local anesthetic will come as like a 1% solution. Does anyone know what that means? The 1% solution, like how much is that? Like, Right, no one knows what that is, and I, I'm a pharmacist, and most pharmacists don't actually uh, probably couldn't tell you what that is. But you guys are going to be better than that, and we'll know based off what I teach you now. So, 1% solution basically means you have 1 gram per 100 mLs. If I had a 2% solution, that's going to be 2 grams per 100 mLs. 
Um, you guys remember sodium uh, normal saline? Remember what percentage that is? Yeah, it's 0.9. So that means there's 0.9 grams per 100 ml of sodium chloride for every 100 ml of that uh, uh, that solution. Okay, so that's well all well and good, you know, to know oh, it's one gram per 100 ml. But that doesn't really help me out. What I really want to know is like how many milligrams per ml is that concentration? Because I can use that number. I can use it to to dose based off of you know how many mg per kilo they should be receiving. And so this uh, question comes up pretty frequently. Is like especially whether you're doing like laceration repairs or suturing, you'll be injecting lidocaine into the area, and you want to make sure you don't inject too much. If you do too much, then you can end up seeing um, heart problems. You can have like CNS problems. You don't want to do that. Um, so it's important that you kind of determine how much can they actually receive. And so in this case, uh, the patient should be getting at, uh, at max five milligrams per kilogram. Okay. And so uh, the question, you know, especially like our program over at Nemours, we have medics that will actually do uh, a lot of the suturing because it frees up the providers to go see other patients. Uh, they're really good at it. Um, but a lot of times they come up and say, "How much lidocaine can I use?" You know, based on this kind of five mg per kilo dose you have here. And so how much, how much, how many mLs can I actually inject into the patient before it's a problem? And so we'll actually do this calculation. And so essentially the rule is, is that if you were to, I'm going to try to draw this out with my poor penmanship. Um, so if you have a 1% solution, that should be a circle, not a very good circle. Okay. 1%. Um, that's going to be basically all you do is move that decimal place over one spot. It should be an arrow, okay? So 1% solution turns into 10 milligrams. Boy, this looks really bad. Per ml. Okay? If I had a 2% solution, that would turn into how many milligrams per ml? 20. 20, yeah. You just move the decimal place over one spot. Um, if I wanted to figure out how many milligrams of sodium chloride are every ml of normal saline, it's 0.9%. It would end up being, yeah, 9 milligrams, okay? Um, so that's important because now I can say, okay, well, the patient can receive at max uh, five milligrams per kilogram. So I would do five times that 24, okay, which is what? Yeah, so it would equal out to be 120. And so I said, well, I know that this solution is 10 milligrams per ml with a 1% solution. And so I would do what at that point? Yeah, 120 divided by 10, you get? 12 ml. So if it's a particularly large laceration, they need to numb up a large area in order to do their suturing. Uh, I can give they can give a total of 12 ml before uh, they hit that max dose. Okay. Now if I were using a 2% solution, how much could I use? Six. Yeah, just six ml, right? So you're just going to cut that in half. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So whenever you see a percentage, you can convert it to milligrams per ml very easily by just moving uh, the decimal place over one place to the right. All right. Fun stuff. So any questions on the peed stuff? All right, with what little time I have left, I'm going to start talking about monitoring. So anyways, uh, here's an objective we'll cover we go through it because I need to hurry up. So anywho, um, so therapeutic drug monitoring. So some of the definitions we're going to look at, uh, basically this is measuring blood levels of a, a drug in order to determine are we dosing it appropriately? Are we getting enough drug in the system to cause therapeutic effects? Or are we not getting too much in order to cause toxicity? Um, do we do this for every single drug? No, it wouldn't be very cost effective. It's not really useful in a lot of cases. Uh, we do this for drugs that have um, narrow therapeutic indexes, right? So in that case where that ED50 and that TD50, they start to overlap pretty close together, um, we want to make sure we can avoid those toxicities as best we can. And so we do this therapeutic drug monitoring to do that. Uh, basically, a peak is going to be considered to be the highest level of drug that uh, happens after a dose, whether it be orally or IV. Um, the highest level you get is going to be the peak, and the trough is going to be the lowest level um, that you get before the next dose happens. Okay. So in this case here, if I were doing uh, repeated dosing, let's see. Here we go. Um, so in this case, like if I were to dose, say, something IV and I were to get the peak here, and then the trough would end up being the lowest dose at this point before I give that next dose. Okay. Here again would be if I gave the dose here, you get the peak, and then the trough is going to be that lowest level before the next dose gets administered. Okay. Notice here uh, that you kind of get this nice uh, waveform that happens when you're uh, the amount that you're putting into the system is the amount leaving the system. Do you guys remember that term for that? A steady state. Remember steady state? Right, so we want to achieve steady state because that means that the amount of drug we're staying in is going to be the amount that's coming out of that. Now, if we have like a missed dose, you notice that the trough would be much different because as that drug would just naturally uh, uh, be metabolized on its own, um, it would get down pretty low, and then you could say dose it again and get back up to that same peak. Okay, so 
we're going to look at some of the details in here, some of the finer points to make sure you're dosing your patients appropriately. And a lot of times you'll see, especially with um, antibiotics and things like that, there's going to be a minimum window that you need to hit to make sure you stay above this point. And then there's a kind of an upper limit uh, where you don't want to uh, exceed because then you're going to see more likely to have uh, toxicity that happens there. So especially with certain things like vancomycin is a really important one. Uh, it's a good gram-positive uh, killing antibiotic. Um, we actually make sure we want to keep that trough above the, the low point here because once it drops below that, that minimum point, bacteria just starts growing again, right? So we'll talk about some of the details when we get to farm more specifically, but we'll look at uh, therapeutic drug monitoring here. Okay, so remember we mentioned that you can dose, uh, in order to get the same average steady state, there are several ways you could do that. You could do it by a continuous infusion. And again here, uh, this would take, uh, a, you know, and how many half-lives does it take to get the steady state? You're at four to five or so, right? So right in the, around that range, so four to five half-lives or so. Uh, as you see with the continuous infusion, I can get there roughly four to five half-lives or so, okay? And I can maintain that average concentration indefinitely as long as I'm still infusing that into the patient. Um, but that's not very convenient in a lot of cases, right? We don't want to necessarily give drugs by continuous infusion if we don't need to. So other cases we would do is do intermittent dosing. And so you can change lots of things. You can change how big of a dose you give. Uh, you can change how frequently you give it. So in this case, you can give a drug um, more frequently at smaller doses and achieve the same average steady state. Uh, and notice how you're not going to have really big swings in your peaks and your troughs there. Versus if I give a larger dose and give it less frequently, so notice uh, this is kind of big peaks here, um, you can run into problems where you can see like maybe this is too high of a peak and you're seeing toxicity or maybe this is too low and you're not getting efficacy anymore. You're getting, say, the bacteria starting to grow again. So, uh, and sometimes you're going to see that we may give drugs more frequently in order to make sure we're staying in that narrow window versus giving a drug, say, once a day or, uh, um, you know, once every other day or something like that, okay? Again, steady state is going to be after the average uh, concentration that we're going to get um, when basically the amount we're putting in equals the amount that's going to be leaving the body through metabolism and excretion. All right, so looking at clinical pharmacokinetics, this is that application of those principles we've already kind of talked about ad nauseum uh, to make sure we have kind of safe and effective therapeutic management for those patients. Um, and we're looking at uh, both the desired response, the efficacy we're looking at, and also trying to prevent that toxicity from occurring based on the, uh, the actual uh, level of the drug that we can measure within the serum. So um, therapeutic drug monitoring is just using those serum drug concentrations to help us try to optimize, make sure we're dosing the patients as, as appropriately as we can. Um, we try to be as proactive as we can and try to uh, evaluate a patient prior to getting the drug to say, like, okay, well, what's the renal function doing? What's their liver function doing? Um, you know, do they have an altered volume of distribution? We try to do that uh, ahead of time so that way we can kind of guess what dose will be best for that patient and what frequency. Um, but in some cases, we're going to be doing it more retroactively where we uh, will dose a drug based on the levels and we'll kind of make some, some adjustments there. So it's important to understand uh, the kind of the potential benefits here, uh, some of the severe limitations to it, and where are some applications where you might actually use it to, to um, kind of help with our therapeutic uh, decision making. All right. Um, and again, basically, uh, we're trying to shoot for this therapeutic range um, above which, uh, if you get above that, toxicity is too likely to occur, and below which, therapeutic effects are unlikely to happen. All right. So again, we want to make sure that, especially with drugs that have, uh, you know, this kind of overlap that occurs here, right? Because again, we don't want to dose a drug at the ED50 because we'd like for everyone to have uh, the beneficial effect of receiving a drug, right? You want, you want, you want better than 50-50 odds to actually have uh, therapeutic effects. So again, we're going to be dosing higher than that. Um, but again, looking at that overlap that happens, the toxicity there. So the point is to try to make it uh, as effective as we can with little toxicity as possible. All right. So again, we mentioned that the slope can be very steep. It can be uh, very, very shallow. What, what, what does that difference in slope mean? It has to do with how you change the dose and how big of a change in effect you're going to get along with that, right? Um, so things can have a very shallow slope, meaning that we can give uh, large changes in doses, and you really don't see either a big change in the efficacy or a big change in the toxicity. That's, those aren't the drugs we're concerned about doing therapeutic drug monitoring on. It's really the ones that can have these kind of really steep kind of toxic side effects uh, curves to where even small changes in dose can lead to toxicity or small decreases in uh, dose can lead to inactivity. Okay, So again, these are going to be for things that have a narrow therapeutic index, things that oftentimes are going to have kind of very steep slopes. Again, uh, usually you're going to be looking at these narrow therapeutic drugs where, again, there's a lot of overlap between toxicity and that uh, um, efficacy there.
So um, looking at the, the variability that we can uh, factor into this again, so I can give, I can choose the drug dose, right? You can choose how often you give a drug and how much you actually give it. Um, and there's going to be some pharmacokinetic variability within the patient. This is probably going to be the most um, kind of widely changing thing based on your individual patient. That's going to result in some sort of concentration at the effect site. And then we'll also have those kind of pharmacodynamic variabilities here uh, that leads to our effects. Okay, uh, We're going to focus mostly on the pharmacokinetic variability here because those are the things that we can uh, most easily uh, calculate and then things we can most easily measure uh, when, when adjusting our doses. So again, we know that lots of different things are going to um, lead to variations in response, looking at things like drug interactions, uh, obesity, age, uh, disease states. All these can be affecting both uh, pharmacokinetics and dynamics, and that can lead to all kinds of uh, variability in, in drug dosing. So we try to be as prospective as we can, look at the type of patient we're dealing with, so that way we can guess, okay, you're more likely to uh, have good effects from this dose of a drug given this often uh, versus this type of patient who could receive a totally different regimen. We already mentioned that between neonates and adult patients, how those doses can change pretty widely already. Um, you know, just briefly, we've been doing this since about the 1950s, and as drug levels are uh, cheaper and more readily available, this gets much um, more clinically relevant. Um, for instance, back in the day when uh, toxicologists had iron overdoses, um, they used to not really be able to get good iron levels. Okay. Um, nowadays, I can get an iron level anytime I want in the hospital. It used to be send outs, right? So you'd have to send it over to another lab in order to get the levels back. Um, you know, you'd come back in two days and your patient was either alive or dead. And it, it didn't really matter what the iron level was at that point, right? Um, you it used to be what they did was they gave a drug called defroxamine. They would uh, give them a shot uh, intramuscularly. And if their urine changed color, that would actually give them a sign that, hey, there's too much iron here. Um, Random, random uh, side bit there, but just know that uh, as time goes on, uh, a lot of these drug levels are easier to uh, obtain, uh, even though some of them may still be, you know, send down and some may incur some pretty significant cost. Uh, but again, we know that a lot of adverse effects are going to be due just to standard doses. Not everyone is built the same. Not everyone can tolerate that same dose of drug. So, um, Again, we expected that drug concentrations would provide a better indicator than just specifically looking at the weight of a patient, looking at the dose we're giving. Um, by looking at those concentrations, it would give us a much better idea of what the actual concentration of that drug would be at the tissue site uh, or at the, at the site of action, and that would give us a better idea of how we can uh, adjust the dose appropriately. Anyway, um, so important thing to consider here, we don't do this for a very large number of drugs, but the ones we do it for are very, um, very likely to lead to uh, either big problems if it do, the drug doesn't work or big issues if the drug is working too well. Okay, so for instance with vancomycin, if you're coming into the ICU because you have a really rocking gram, uh, gram positive uh, MRSA pneumonia, um, you probably want to get rid of that infection, right? So you need to make sure you got enough vancomycin on board to do that. But you also don't want to cause kidney problems, cause hearing problems, and so you want to make sure the dosing doesn't get too uh, too high to lead to those issues. Okay, so these are the kind of drugs we're going to be doing that for. Uh, Digoxin is another good example. Um, uh, because again, it's a heart medication. A lot of those antiarrhythmics are more likely to have those levels done to make sure, because I mentioned any antiarrhythmic can also cause arrhythmias, and we want to prevent that from happening there. So, um, a lot of drugs, though, you don't have to look at actual serum measurements. You can look at other kind of surrogate markers for their function. So, for instance, um, you know, for blood pressure, I don't have to measure the actual level of propranolol in the body, a beta blocker. I can just measure your blood pressure and tell how well the drug's working, right? Uh, I can tell whether I need to adjust the dose or not. Or if I was giving something like simvastatin or a statin drug for cholesterol, I can just measure your cholesterol. So you don't really necessarily have to look at the actual drug levels there. Um, and then certain drugs will actually use other measures as well. It's so like warfarin's a really big one um, where uh, you'll have a lot of like anti-coag clinics that are focused uh, mainly just on dosing warfarin. Um, and we don't measure warfarin levels. Those aren't super useful. We can just look at the PTI and R. That'll tell us directly how well anticoagulated the patient is. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's a direct measure in the fact that um, it's more like a surrogate marker, I guess you would call it, right? So something that you're using to infer how well that drug's going to be working. Um, so don't get really caught up in whether it's a direct or indirect measure so much. Just know that we're using some other form of measurement to determine how well the drug's going to be working. Okay. So again, if it was like, okay, this drug is, um, you because know, it's something like an antibiotic, right? Antibiotics are kind of more difficult to tell, like, you know, how well is that infection clearing versus uh, the patient kind of resolving spontaneously. Like, those are more likely ones that we can look at drug levels to get an idea of how well it should be killing those bacteria, right? Especially when you know how resistant the bugs might be and if we're making sure we're getting our levels high enough to actually kill them off.
So uh, some of the assumptions that we're looking at uh, when we're doing therapeutic drug monitoring, uh, if we measure the drug concentration, that provides an opportunity to adjust uh, for that pharmacokinetic variability and help us to individualize the dose. So if we're measuring levels, it should mean that we have the ability to alter that dose, alter the frequency in order to make sure that we can change what that level should be when we measure it subsequently. Um, it should be in the case where drug concentration is a better predictor of response than dose. In those cases where um, looking at you know blood pressure medication, measuring the blood pressure is a much better uh, marker for that than natural drug levels themselves. Uh, and then there should be a good relationship between drug concentration and the pharmacologic response. There are some drugs, especially things like um, anti-epileptics or things for seizures, um, that it's really hard to tell how effective those drugs are going to be, right? Uh, because uh, you know if you don't have a seizure for a good long time, is it the drug that prevented it, or is it just because the patient just it wouldn't have had a seizure regardless, right? Kind of like elephant repellent, you know, elephant repellent works great. There's no elephants around here. Okay, well, probably no elephants anyway. Um, so it's that sort of thing, right? So you need to make sure that um, there's a good relationship between those drug concentrations and the, the response you should be getting from that, okay? All right, so looking at drug response, so the exposure, and this is going to be what the patient's actually experiencing as they get the drug, um, is going to be based on certain things that the clinician can control versus things that we cannot control. Things that we can control, dose, how often we give the drug. We can all factor into that and, and, and make adjustments to that to make sure that we take into account how well the bioavailability of the drug is, right? Patient uh, is going to be the, the sole contributor to that, and they, again, don't have any control over that, and also how well they're going to clear that whether it be hepatically, whether it be renally, uh, we have no control over this. So we're really trying to um, balance out these two principles uh, by changing the dose and interval to make sure they're hitting their, their appropriate uh, level. Okay. Um, looking at therapeutic ranges, so a lot of drugs that we do therapeutic drug monitoring on, you'll notice they have different ranges associated with them. Um, so for instance, like phenytoin, I mentioned for seizures, is one that we actually monitor more often for toxicity necessarily than for therapeutic effect. Um, but you'll see that that one, we uh, have a level of say 10 to 20 mics per ml. Like I just know that's a therapeutic range. If you're above that, you're more likely to see toxicity. If you're less than that, probably more likely to have seizures that occur there. And so when you deal with some of these drugs more frequently, you'll, you'll get accustomed to that and you'll kind of know what those levels are going to be. I'm not going to have you memorize them on this test uh, by any means. Uh, so just be aware of that. I'll put a, a reference range um, if I include it on a test question. But anywho, um, it's all based on probabilities, based on studies they did uh, to determine, okay, well, these group of patients, uh, we uh, performed this kind of study in them, and we found that, okay, these levels tended to be therapeutic without causing too much toxicity. Um, do you think the, the quality of that evidence is great in every single case? Not, not usually, right? And sometimes it's like, you know, maybe a couple dozen patients that we use to, and we extrapolate that out to everybody, right? So sometimes it's not going to be perfect. Uh, and those therapeutic ranges can change over time, uh, depending on, you know, different circumstances. As, as we get more, um, uh, more evidence and more kind of experience with using the drugs. Uh, but basically, that therapeutic range is going to be that drug concentration which has the highest probability of having a good clinical response and a probability of having uh, low toxicity. Okay, um, so I can have a patient who is dosed smack dab in the middle of that therapeutic range. They can still have toxicity and not have any effect from that drug. Okay, um, some people will be therapeutic below the therapeutic range. Some people will be toxic below that therapeutic range. It just depends on um, what, uh, how that patient is going to be responding to that drug. Um, so a good example, does anyone know what happens if you have too much aspirin? It's a common side effect. I'm bleeding. So uh, tinnitus is, is a thing that you can actually have happen. So if you ever hear like an aspirin overdose, they complain of like muffled hearing or that kind of ringing in their ears. Um, so that's one of those things where like most people don't get that when they take a therapeutic dose of aspirin. Um, one of my old bosses, uh, every time she took uh, any amount of aspirin, she automatically got uh, tinnitus, right? Um, so it's one of those things where like some people are just going to be more sensitive to it than others. Some people will be very kind of resistant to some of the effects of these drugs. So everyone's a little bit different. Uh, they're all kind of snowflakes. Sometimes they're not snowflakes, but sometimes they are. The important thing, though, is that we make sure we treat the patient and not the number. I uh, see this very too frequently where providers will look at a number on a level and they'll say, like, this is too low. We need to adjust the dose. And I'm like, well, the patient's fine. Like, they haven't had a seizure. They're not having any toxicity. Just leave it alone, right? Um, or the level looks like it's too high that we have to drop the dose. The patient's doing fine. You know, again, uh, always make sure you're assessing the patient. Or, you know, if the dose looks like it's in a good range, the level comes back normal, uh, but the patient's not having any good effect. Okay, you got to go back to the patient see what's going on to see why they're not really responding the way you want them to. Okay, so always treat the patient, not the number. Okay, so some other things. Um, again, range is generally going to be characterized by in a small population, so looking at who that study population was is really important. You know, if some of this data was coming back from the 50s and they only looked at, um, you know, 30-year-old men and they looked at 
three dozen of them, does that apply to your 90-year-old little lady, uh, African-American lady, uh, who's getting this drug? It may not be super applicable in some cases, and so you'll, you'll learn some of those caveats as you go forward. Um, and sometimes it can be really difficult to ascertain where those ranges come from. Sometimes it's kind of this medical dogma where you're like, well, where does this, where does this actual value come from? And it's really hard to find. You have to go dig through like journals from like you know decades and decades ago to figure out where it comes from. And sometimes we just accept that stuff as, as um, uh, you know, as the truth without having any like kind of um, going back and actually re-examining that data again. So just be aware there's a lot of um, kind of stuff out there that may not be 100% accurate for all your patients. Okay. Um, again, so when you're looking at target concentrations, uh, basically you're going to be selecting, hey, I want this concentration uh, for this indication. Um, usually we're not going to shoot for a range necessarily, although that therapeutic range is um, you know, going to be okay for them to fall. So good examples like vancomycin. Uh, vancomycin can be dosed at several uh, different ranges. Um, so for instance, if I have a, uh, a really nasty MRSA pneumonia, right, I'm going to dose for a higher uh, level in order to make sure I can penetrate that lung tissue. So I may dose between 15 to 20 micrograms per mile. That's the the range I'm shooting for, I'm probably going to shoot for getting right in the middle of there, right? So that we have a specified target. I'll say 17 and a half is the one I want to shoot for. As long as the level comes back between those two numbers, I'm okay though, right? And so and again, uh, initially you assume the patient behaves like an average member of the population, unless they have something obvious um, that's going to alter that. So if they have a change in volume of distribution, if they have a change in renal function, uh, anything that may be affecting that, those things you want to take into account beforehand. And then um, we're going to be using kind of average pharmacokinetic parameters. So for a lot of these drugs, there'll be averages for things like um, uh, that elimination constant I mentioned a few uh, lectures ago, or their half-life, right, or their volume distribution. Patients are all going to be a little bit different, but we can use some of these averages to get us started to try to predict what kind of dose is going to be best for that patient, okay? And we use that information to calculate what their dosing regimen should be, whether it be we give a gram of this drug every 12 hours or we give 750 every eight hours, whatever it happens to be, we're using these kind of population averages to assume what our patient would respond best to, okay? may not always be accurate, but it was at least a good place to start. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it here. Do a 10 minute break and then we'll come back uh, and start up some physio stuff.